It says uh, in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, is where we see this story. Now, the story is also recorded in the book of Luke, but we're going to be reading it here from Mark. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. So he had just been out. He had been performing uh, a number of miracles, but he came back to Capernaum. Capernaum was kind of like, like his, his uh, home base for his ministry during this time. So he comes back home, and people already, they hear that he's coming, and they want to see this Jesus. It says, soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. So here he is. He's come back after traveling a little bit. He's been performing miracles. He's been preaching, but he comes back home, and he's at the house that he's staying at, and then people just start gathering, and they start coming, and and, and it's like standing room only, and there's just so many people crammed into this house, even outside the door. Like, it's it's flowing out into into the city streets. It says, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. And they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So here they come. They come. They see this crowd. They can't get there. So it says, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head, and they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, maybe maybe you've been to some parties, and maybe you've seen some weird things. Have you ever seen any weird things at parties before? Okay, some of you are brave enough. Some of you are like, I I can't even raise my hand because it's been crazy, right? Some weird things. But You probably never saw something quite like this. This was weird. They're at this party. Jesus is preaching. He's teaching in this home that he's staying, and it's just jam-packed. Like, there's no room for anybody. And people are just on top of each other, crammed in this. And and these four guys come with their friend, and their friend is basically on a stretcher, and they bring him up, and, and they can't even get in. Like, there's just so many people there. There's even religious leaders, scribes and Pharisees that are in attendance there, and and they're not really there because they love Jesus. They're kind of skeptical, right? They're trying to to catch a slip-up that Jesus might make. They're trying to examine and cross-examine and evaluate every word that comes out of his mouth. And then imagine seeing these four people that come up, and and they have this guy on a stretcher, and clearly he can't walk. And nobody is letting them in. They're like, excuse me, pardon me, can we just get in there? You know, excuse me. And everybody's just looking looking at him like, like, no, you can't get in there, right? Like, Like, you can't cut the line. You have to go to the back of the line and wait like everyone else. And they're like, well... Well, we, you know, we, we're, we just want to get in there and see Jesus. And they're like, yeah, of course, we all want to see Jesus. And so nobody was letting them come in. You think that maybe the religious leaders would help? Because they're the ones, after all, that maybe you'd want to go to to, to, to help, to seek God for the, the condition you're facing. But no, the religious leaders were no help. Nobody was helping them. Nobody was budging. No one was making room for these four individuals with their friend to get in to see Jesus. So... The friends get resourceful. Imagine that conversation, right? They're like, well, we can't get in. Somebody's like, well, why don't we just leave? Another person's like, well, you know, we can just wait here and just see how long it takes. Another guy's like, I got an idea. They got a roof, right? Let's cut a hole in the roof and go down through the hole in the roof. And another guy's like, you're crazy. Another guy's like, I kind of like this idea. They're like, yeah, why don't we do this? So then, they, so, so, so then they're, they're going to go up there. It's like, like the guys, you know, guys always want to fix the problem, right? We're like, we, we will do it. We will get this guy in there. Whatever it takes, we're going to cut a hole. Let's do this. Let's, let's go in, up there. And, and now, now the, the roofs in those days, it was common. They would have a flat roof. It was a, a flat house. And the roof was, was much like a, like a deck or a patio. They would go and they would hang out up there. They would sit there. They would eat there. Sometimes on cool nights, they might sleep up there. So they, and they would usually have stairs on the outside of the house that would get you up to this upper level of the house. So, so they go up there. Now, if you imagine, you know, the people down below, right? So they're down there. They're listening to Jesus. Everyone's spellbound. He's speaking. They're listening. And then they hear footsteps on the roof. Like, okay, well, that's kind of weird. They hear a lot of footsteps. Like, well, this is kind of weird. But whatever. They're still listening to Jesus. And then... Debris starts falling in. 
It's like, what's going on? Like, you hear somebody like banging, hitting, ripping, and then a small hole begins to appear. You might imagine somebody's like, what are you doing? Like, what is going on? Well, like, what is happening here? Well, these four friends were desperate to get to Jesus. I can't help but uh, admiring their determination. They were determined to get their friend to Jesus no matter what. Sometimes, sometimes we give up too easily. We give up too easily when it comes to seeking God on behalf of our family, our friends. Sometimes we give up too easily when, when it comes to, to, to praying for healing and things like that. These guys were not giving up. In your notes, don't give up so easily. Do we ever give up easily? I had a similar experience, except it wasn't so spiritual in nature. It was, uh, you know, several years ago, I decided I was going to go drive down to New Jersey to go to Carlos Bakery. Now, Carlos Bakery, some of you might know what Carlos Bakery is, um, but, but it, this, it's a show Cake Boss, and he makes all these cakes and all this stuff. So I'm like, I'm going to drive down there. Uh, it's a couple-hour drive, and I'm going to get, you know, some, some goodies, some cakes, and stuff like that, bring it home for the family. So I went down there. Clearly, I had not thought this through. did not understand what I was getting into. I get there, and I'm trying to look for, you know, Carlos Bakery. I happen to see a long line of people. I assume they're waiting for a show or something like that. I park my car. I come out, and no, they aren't waiting for a show. They're waiting to get into Carlos Bakery. I mean, this was two city blocks long. So I go, and I'm asking people, I'm like, like, where's the line? They're like, way down there. So I go all the way down. And I'm at the end of the line, and, and I'm, I'm asking people, like, how long have you been waiting? They're like, oh, we've only been here for two hours. I'm like, only here for two hours? I'm like, this is crazy. So I stayed in the line for about a half an hour and moved about 10 feet in that process. And then I said, you know what? I'm not going to go to Carlos Bakery. I, I, so I, I went somewhere else. I got something different. I just headed home. I'm like, I'm not going to wait here all day to get this food. You know, and and that, that may be a similar situation they were feeling. It's like, man, there's such a line here. Like, we're not going to wait. we got to figure something out. Now, I, on the other hand, did not cut a hole in the roof to get in and get any baked goods. I, di I didn't want to spend any time in jail for that. But here, that's what they did. See, they weren't just going to accept the fact that it was a crowded place. Well, I guess we can't get in. Sorry, buddy. I guess you're not going to walk for even a longer period of time. No, they were committed. They were committed to getting their buddy in there to see Jesus. And you got to admire that. In your notes, don't underestimate the power of bringing someone to Jesus. You know, this is just an astonishing story of, of four friends. Like, we don't even know, like, this, this person who couldn't walk, we don't even know if he wanted to go there, right? But, I mean, he couldn't walk, so he couldn't leave anyway. They're like, we're bringing you to Jesus. He could have been like, I don't want to go. And they're like, well, too, too bad for you. We're bringing you anyhow. We don't know the whole story, but they're bringing them. They had faith for someone else. See, they knew they couldn't heal him, but they could bring him to Jesus, Similarly, in our lives, we can't heal somebody, we can't save somebody, but what we can do is bring them. We can bring them. This is a great mission for, for any person, for any woman, any man, any boy, any girl. It's a great mission for, for a dad to set the example, to bring the family, to bring friends. To, to, I, you know, maybe I can't do everything. Maybe I can't answer every question, but I can bring you closer to Jesus. So here they are. Jesus is in there. He's talking to everybody. Everybody's listening. The hole starts coming, and then now Jesus loses the crowd, right? Like, I mean, Jesus is a great communicator, but you got to think, at some point, nobody was listening to Jesus anymore. They're like, we got to watch this hole. Like, what's going on here? This is a big hole. I mean, because you think about it, right? I mean, they're going to lower a guy down here. So, I mean, you think, it's not just like a, like a, like a round hole. I mean, what are they going to do? Tip him up sideways, tie ropes to him, and like go down vertically? No, they have to like kind of like layer lower him down on, on his little, you know, stretcher there. So they're ripping this huge hole, and they're, and they're just going. Everyone's like, what are you doing? And they're like, be quiet, we're, we're working here. So they're, they're ripping this out, this major hole. Slowly, I can imagine there was lights for dramatic effect, the, 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 this, uh, this cot just like lowers down slowly. Think about the teamwork on that. Like imagine four guys lowering down another human being. Like, like what if one guy goes a little bit too fast, and there he goes, just, well, you were lame before, but now you're dead, sorry, you know? Um, <laughs> So they lower him down, and he just comes slowly down, right in front of everybody. Boom, hits the floor, right in front of Jesus. It's crazy. Everyone's silent. In fact, in both accounts of this, there's no recorded words. Nobody says anything. No, nobody says anything. And like the, the friends don't say anything. Nobody, they're just like watching, like what is going on here? Everybody's just staying, staring at this. 
Mark, uh, continue on Mark 2, uh, verse 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Kind of a weird thing to say. My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. So he, he comes down, he hits the, the ground, and Jesus says, hey man, your sins are forgiven. And the religious leaders are thinking like, oh, you can't do that, that's blasphemy. They, they were looking for something, right? They were looking for something to get Jesus on. And I mean, and they were, they were looking for any little slip up, any little mistake, and here he is handing it to them on a silver platter. The gauntlet was thrown down like he was not hiding behind anything. What he's doing in that moment is he's claiming to be divine. He's claiming to be God. This isn't an easy thing to claim. He's saying, well, your sins are forgiven. But one thing that we do know, and it says here, is that in your notes, only God has the power to forgive sins. So Jesus is now making himself equal to God. He's saying, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven, your sins are, it's kind of an odd thing to say, don't you think? I mean, kind of odd. Like this guy comes down, and, and he lays there on the floor. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't say, would you forgive me? You know, he didn't say anything. Jesus is like, hey, man, your sins are forgiven. It's kind of weird. Now, in that day and age, many people assumed that physical ailments, physical deformities, sicknesses, and the like were caused by sins that either you committed or your parents had committed. That was the assumption that sin caused this. Now, we don't know what caused this person to not be able to walk. We don't know physically, spiritually. We don't know. It could have been a spinal cord injury. It could have been a problem with his legs. Like, we don't know what the problem was. But as he comes down there and is laid on the ground in front of Jesus, Jesus didn't do the obvious thing, right? What would have been the obvious thing? Get up and walk. You heal him. Get up and walk. Okay. That would have been obvious, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And see, it was, it was bad enough that Jesus was healing people. Like the religious leaders didn't like the fact that he was healing people, but now he's forgiving sins? Now he's telling people that their sins are, like, like this is blasphemy, and the penalty of blasphemy was death. And Jesus knew their thoughts. See, this was not a mistake. This was, this was Jesus like playing chess. Like he was being strategic here. He did this on purpose, and he's kind of like, let me prove it to you. See, he says, Going on in verse 8, Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Like, imagine that. Imagine they're thinking, oh, this is blasphemy. Oh, this is horrible. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus immediately makes eye contact with them and says, why are you questioning this? He said, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Which is easier? Well, if you think of like, like I could, I could bring somebody up here, right, that has maybe a, a, a deformity or, or maybe they're unable to walk, right? I could bring them up here in front of everybody and I could say, which is easier? It's easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, right? Now, it seems blasphemous, but it's easy because you can't tell whether or not it worked. Like, you don't know if his sins were forgiven or not. I say, hey, man, your sins are forgiven. And then he hobbles back off the stage again. You're like, well, well, we don't know. Is this real? Is it not real? What's easier? It's easier for me to say that than if I say, hey, man, you're healed. Well, now he's actually got to be healed to demonstrate the power, right? So Jesus says, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Verse 10. I love this. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Think about the logic here. He, first he says, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> oh, we don't believe you. Okay, well, that was easy to say. Now I'm going to say what's harder. He says, so I'm going to prove that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. See, that was the harder thing because now it's the visual and it says, verse 12, and the man jumped up, immediately jumps up, grabs his map, walks out through the stunned onlookers, and they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. He gets up, he runs home, he's celebrating. The four guys up on the roof, they're celebrating. They're high-fiving, like, yeah, this is great. They all run off the roof. They're all, they're all running home, like leaving this wake of a destroyed house behind them, you know? It's like they're, they're just out of there now. 
Everybody said, we've never seen anything like this before. What is going on? How is this happening? See, Jesus met two needs that day. The man clearly had a physical need, right? The fact that he couldn't walk was the, was the physical need. It was the obvious need. And we don't know what caused that, but it was apparent to everyone. Anyone who ever saw this man knew that he had a disability, that he was unable to get up and walk. It affected his entire life. Very likely he was forced to beg. Very likely he was forced to be dependent on friends and family. Obviously he couldn't even go see Jesus on his own. He needed four friends to bring him there. So that was the obvious need. That was the first need. But there was a second need, and it was not as evident. And this was a need that was overlooked, but yet it was more important. See, his ultimate need was not healing. His ultimate need was forgiveness. See, our ultimate need is never a physical need. Our ultimate need is always a spiritual need. See, it's easy to look at this, and we think that the miracle was the fact that he got up and walked, but really the miracle was the fact that his sins were forgiven. See, he could have gotten up and walked, but if his sins were not forgiven, he would not have been made right with God. But see, Jesus met both needs, the obvious one and the one that was not so obvious. See, our, our ultimate need is never physical. It's always spiritual. 